Hello here and welcome again to another edition of the Husker Online Show. Sean Callahan, Steve Sim, Robin Washington. We are back at it. Spring practice coming off the Easter break. Four practices in here through Tuesday. Um, so we're still kind of establishing the storylines, uh, but that is a discussion. And by the way, Steve Sipple just getting out of bowling league, I think. <laughs> oh, Sean, I can't take credit for that line. <laughs> just firing a salvo right off the bat. <laughs> you got a real, like shirt, don't you? Got a real Vince Vaughn swingers vibe going on. <laughs> was it a, um, <laughs> was it a like, journal star bowling league of former colleagues? Or like, what kind of bowling league are you in? I'm not in a bowling league. This is a legit <laughs> shirt from Super Saver. It came out of a so, pen. Um, Steve Sipple <laughs> got his shirt at Super Saver from like the, the grab bag pin. It looks good. I took it to the cleaners. Um, you I took, tried cleaning it? Yeah. That bill probably cost more than the shirt cost. <laughs> oh, I absolutely did. I can tell you 100%. It's like a $12 true. dry clean bill for yeah. an $8 but, shirt. Yeah. It was actually a gift. I got to come clean because the, the, the person who gave these, shirt, gave these shirts to me listens to our show. And he was at Super Saver one day and he saw a bin with shirts in it and he grabbed three and all multicolors and brought them to the radio station. And Damn. yeah. And, and I took a liking to this one and I took it. So I took them to the get dry clean <laughs> and I kind of like, I like this. Shirt. Put a Miami dolphins logo on there and look like you're, I mean, I legitimately like this shirt. Like I it's comfortable. Yeah. It looks good. You needed that for Hawaii is what you needed it for. Yeah. It would have been good, but all right, let's, let's I got talk. an orange one too that I don't know. I just don't know if Ooh, I can yeah. do that. That's orange with a white with white. Wear that to the spring game. Maybe coach rule. Wear to the spring game. It's Throw daring. a line out to you. It's daring. It's daring. All right. Well, you gotta be in the right mood for that one. Yeah. As they would say, let's talk ball now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Bill self. Um, um, all right, let's get into, um, Spring ball. I mean, not not a lot cooking yet. Just kind of the early storylines. We've talked to Tony White. We talked to Matt Rule, Terrence Knight, and some players. Mm -hmm. The first scrimmage won't happen, presumably probably till Saturday is my guess. I mean, they're just kind of laying. We don't know that for sure, but usually you get two Saturday scrimmages, one early, one later. Um, so you would assume that we'll learn a lot more as this week moves through. Is it the, This was practice number four, four correct? Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, we learned today, we learned that they want to be the number one defense in the country, which I guess every team wants to be, but there's only certain ones that can really say it. Nebraska was number 11 in the country last year. The only thing I'd add to that conversation is Michigan was the number one defense in the country, and it had two first-team All-Big Ten players and four second-team All-Big Ten players. Note that Nebraska had zero zero in the first two teams. Nebraska's got to do that. I mean, if they're going to be the top defense in the nation – You'd probably need a couple first team all Big Ten players and maybe an All American or two. That's what it takes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe somebody emerges that way. Maybe not. I don't. I don't see an All American out there right now. Yeah, I guess the the one thing that could lead you to maybe putting that at least as an attainable goal is just how much further ahead they are a year ago, mm -hmm. where last spring everything was just kind of on the run. Everybody was just trying to figure out. Players are trying to learn coaches. Coaches are trying to learn players. Players are trying to learn scheme. Coaches were trying to teach verbiage and all that sort of stuff. And it was really just kind of a uh, a race to see how caught up you could get before the first game. Well, now, I mean, they're building off of where they were at the end of last season. And they have that entire year of experience now under their belt. And each coach and every player that has talked has just kind of lamented on how much of an advantage that is from the start of this spring compared to last this the level of familiarity and comfort from, from both sides, coaches and players, that allows them to be on a significantly higher starting point than where they were. Well, this is something I think that will help their stats, though, on defense early, the schedule. Um, UTEP, Northern Illinois, Iowa, they're not going to – I mean, Colorado could – will be probably oh, be a good yeah. offense. I mean, they got some skill. That, that on paper, is a 500-plus yard per game offense. So that's going to be a great measuring stick, but nothing about Indiana, Purdue – Illinois, Rutgers, nothing, nothing is going to worry you about. I mean, Nebraska's defense can win those games for them early, and they're not they're not going to see elite QB play from either, any of those teams on paper, at least. And you know, Colorado or Ohio State is the game though where you'll see a lot. UCLA will be rebuilding. We know USC will be a great test, but offense, yeah, they have a schedule in my opinion that will allow them to be a top ten defense. Well, let's face it, last year's schedule 
really helped Nebraska's defense. Mm -hmm. He faced a long line of very mediocre offenses, and that helped matters. And also, I thought Terrence Knighton said something that was critical today, critical. He said, we were a really good defense with our backs against the wall, but we got to get off the field. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times against Third Wisconsin down. did we say that? They, they can't get off the damn field. Close that game down. They couldn't get off the field. So, yeah, I mean, I thought Knighton, he said, we were good with our backs against the wall, but we got to be better on third down. Mm -hmm. You see what he's saying? Couldn't get off the field. Yeah, and I, I do think that the teams you play go a long way in determining how good your defense is on oh, paper because yeah. you can be a really good defense, but if you're playing – you know, like the 07 Big 12 you know, lineup where yeah. everybody's putting up 600 yards a game, you're not going to look like it. No. And so I think they do have that advantage. For one, playing four straight games at home. I mean, that's – I can't even remember the last time they did that. And then to be able to play outside of Colorado, some manageable offenses to start, that's going to put uh, a lot of, I think, early momentum behind that defense. It already has a lot to work with now, but once you get that actual tangible game experience to elevate that, that could be the difference maker. And you'll probably have a Friday night road game between Purdue and Indiana. I know the Big Ten, we don't know those these games yet, but supposedly there'll be nine Friday night games this year in the conference. And you would have to think that Purdue and Indiana, one of those two will be a Friday game. Okay. Which I'm okay with. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I know there are the, the get off the lawn, but that for I think for Nebraska going on the road, it's a great deal. Are there people who shake their fist at this? Oh, the, the, Fridays are for high school stuff. So. That's what they, that's the thought. I don't look at high school games. Don't draw anywhere what they used to. And I don't know why that is, but you know, high school games on Friday used to be a lot bigger thing. I mean, they're still big, but I think there's not as much parody in high school football here in Nebraska anymore, where there are a lot of games where you could just, you know, who's going to win. There's not a lot of intrigue. Um, by the way, Rob, and something you said, I get this home schedule and it is works in Nebraska's favor, but Nebraska has got to reclaim its home field. I, do. I mean, it's not like they're, they're no longer a, I mean, it doesn't even seem, oh boy, this is blasphemous, but it, is it, it doesn't seem like it's been that big of an advantage of late, if I'm not mistaken. I don't mm -hmm. know what the record is off the top of my head the last four or five years, but they lose on their home field fairly routinely. Mm -hmm. They have finished games. I mean, they got to reclaim that. Yep. Reclaim well, the What an field. opportunity to do it. Stick a flag in the dirt mm -hmm. turf, um, rubber. Um, and they lost a lot of one score games, but. <laughs> The style of play in this league leads to a lot of one-score games. Mm -hmm. It does close them out, though. I right. mean, I think that's if I were a rule, I would I would emphasize that to our guys. Let's get to back to get this program back to where it doesn't lose at home. Mm -hmm. Get it back. Where when you have a lead inside of two minutes left, you win the game. Close it. You know how many walk-off field goals and, and stuff yeah. by opponents have we seen over the years? It's been too many to count. Right. Can't even name them all. Right. I think that would be a good thing for him to drive home to his guys. You I know, think they are. That's what that whole like with the drive for three or what's yeah. the chasing three. Chasing three. Chasing I think three. it's chasing those three points. What was it? Yeah. Four games decided by a field goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that in itself, right there. And I know it's like, well, why wouldn't you want to be chasing more than that? It's it's the the message. It's about finishing the job and making those one or two extra plays to turn close losses into victories. You're not going to win in the Big Ten by much more than seven very often. It, no. it's, it's like the it's like the NFL. The yeah. point spreads every week are three to seven points. Yep. So it comes down yep. to a, a detail, a little thing. Things, and, yeah. I mean, this is not the 90s where, you know, the point spreads are 40-some points a week. No. And Ohio State's about the only team in this league that gets some of those spreads, but every game is, Michigan too. is a less than a touchdown spread. Yeah, and again, I think that goes back to the difference between year one and year two is where, as opposed to just trying to learn the basics, you're refining yeah. the details. Yeah, and you know, no those, doubt those little things come down to the details. Mm -hmm. and now they can actually have the opportunity to focus on that. And I don't know, you can count it. There's, this is sort of a subjective count that you do, but I you can come up with 17 or 18 guys for Nebraska, on Nebraska's defense that have played significant roles mm -hmm. last year. That's a lot. I mean, 17, 18 guys. That, that have a lot of experience coming back. Linebacker is the one area this spring that they have to kind of tune up. Inside? Yeah. Yeah. And and today White talked about that. You get John Bullock back, which was critical, right? Critical, right? It was crazy to me that he was thinking about not playing another year after the year he had just got had. You know, his value was high at that point. But he came back, and then they got, you know, they got Javin Wright, 
who Mackay Bayer, Mackay Bayer, and Vincent Shavers and Dylan Rogers. Those are the kind of the main guys, right? And then Thompson, who Stephon Thompson is still, as Tony White said, adjusting to a quote different standard at Nebraska compared to what he was w- dealing with before. I wanted to say, go wait, wasn't that your standard that you pitched at Syracuse? <laughs> it was a little see. shot at Syracuse. Yeah, and I don't know if he meant to do it or if it, it maybe it was one of those sentences that was coming out of his mouth and it just got too far down the line to go back. Because wait, he played for Dino Babers. You coach I mean that well, that was the standard you came from. Well yeah now it was a yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm year, trying to I'm trying to help Tony here by digging him out of the hole but I don't know if I can. I mean, well, Coach he, Rule said he had a different standard as the defensive coordinator than maybe the defensive coordinator that replaced him. And Coach so, Rule said, like, Stefan Thompson has a ways to go. Like, he came in out of shape, and we had him at St. Michael's that night, and Rob was there, Brian and, and Greg, and, and we, like, he, he just didn't, his body didn't look hmm. like a guy hmm. that, you know, the other guys, Stefan Tom, or, um, not Stefan Tom, um, Small Banks and Isaiah Nayor. Yeah. When you saw them, you're like, okay, they they brought, but he didn't have the body of a transfer player where you're like, this guy's gonna be better than what they have right now. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. And he had Florida State and Kansas State. He had a number of portal offers. So that his progress will be something to watch, but you hope they can get him in the two deep at some point here. But when we come back, lots going on with basketball. Yeah. So we're we're moving hoops up in the discussion because um, the transfer portal news continues. Jamarcus Lawrence, the big shocker this week, entering the portal. We'll get Robin's thoughts on that. Some portal names that have visited Lincoln as well next. You're listening here to the Husker Online Show. And we're back here on the Husker Online Show. Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, Robin Washhead, as we're going to get into some heavy Nebraska basketball talk. But before we start that discussion, this segment of the Husker Online Show brought to you by Ellerbrock Norris. Ellerbrock Norris has been helping Nebraska business owners protect their purpose for over 120 years with risk management solutions built for local businesses. Ellerbrock Norris partners with you on commercial insurance, group benefits, business exit planning, safety, and more. Start thinking long-term with your business and create a risk management strategy to protect it. Are your employee benefits costs going through the roof? Talk to Ellerbrock. Workplace injuries skyrocketing your workers' compensation costs? Talk to Ellerbrock. Hoping to retire the next 10 years and sell your business to family, key employees, or a friendly competitor? Talk to Ellerbrock. Ellerbrock Norris is helping you protect your purpose, whether it's your business and your employees in it, your life outside of work, or your future retirement goals. Head to ellerbrock-norris.com slash Husker Online today to get your free risk evaluation. That's ellerbrock-norris.com slash Husker Online. Thank you again to Ellerbrock Norris for sponsoring us here on the Husker Online show. All right, Robin, as we were on break, a sixth Nebraska player on scholarship has now gone into the transfer portal. Go. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Uh, So less than 24 hours after Jamarcus Lawrence, uh, somewhat unexpectedly, hits the transfer portal, uh, Matar Jope, the freshman um, kind of long-term project, but guy that showed some flashes of just his physical potential enters the transfer portal. And, you know, I think this is kind of one of those deals where sure Nebraska would have ideally liked to keep him around um, just to develop that potential. He was still extremely raw. And I think that you're in a situation now where the <laughs> idea of keeping a guy like that happy for two to three years necessary for him to develop without really playing that much it just doesn't happen now. He's going to go somewhere where he can go play and develop as opposed to just riding the bench because Nebraska is going to recruit over him. They're going to get better talent. Wow. You look at the bigs that they're in on right now. Like you think that he would just naturally vault up the the pecking order in the rotation. That's just not going to happen. So um, just kind of a, again, another example of the sign of the times where like these guys that you would, you take as kind of a, a long-term project and hope that they eventually reach that potential you just don't keep them anymore. Okay. You've made sense of this one. Matar Jope. Now, make sense of Jamarcus Lawrence. I think you can. Yeah. Can or can you? His is tougher because of, for one, the, I mean, talk about flashes. Like Ooh, he showed that boy. he was a legitimate Big Ten oh, guard. Yeah. And, he was dangerous. And Did he, he had, break 20 points a couple times? Yeah, 19 year? against Indiana. Yeah. His, his career high was 19 points. Um, 
against Indiana this year. So, I mean, he, he has that type of game to him. And especially with kind of, you saw him finally start to find his groove a little bit towards the back half of the year. And a lot of it had to do with taking himself out of the starting lineup, you know, that he wasn't benched. It was like a mutual decision where he kind of saw what CJ Wilcher did uh, when, when he stepped out of the starting lineup and really elevated his play. Well, the same path worked for Jamarcus and it was seemed to be clicking a little bit for him. Now, he still had really high highs. Like he had a stretch of three straight double figure games, including that that Indiana game. But then he also had really bad games where he's scoring, you know, two points on one of seven shooting with five turnovers. Like games like that. So uh, it's, you know, you you kind of wish that it would have been a little bit more stable for him. And if it had, maybe he's viewing his current situation or his situation at Nebraska differently. But you know, I'm sure that people got in his ear and said, hey, guess what? You can come back and, and be closer to New Jersey and, uh, you know, play a role um, off the ball that, you know, you you were more comfortable doing. But at Nebraska, he would have gotten that off the ball role more with Casey leaving. You know, I think that he was probably one of those guys that was going to factor into that two guard spot, okay. maybe help out a little bit at the one. But he'd be pro probably off the ball more than more than he would have this year. Okay. So Hold on. To, to, to try to make sense of it, my, my long way of saying that is, you know, you can see why he wanted to test the waters and see what his options were but you also can see that he had a lot of opportunity here in nebraska that you know he he figured there'd be greener grass somewhere else okay rob maybe would this make sense to you aaron Eulis is on the roster yes he, he, he could definitely be the point guard he had to sit out this year he was a 27 game starter at iowa not a big score though right no but he could be their point guard and that would allow bryce williams to move to a more natural shooting guard position if he wants to it could ace Jamarcus Lawrence out of the whole thing, right? Yeah. Bryce, Bryce Williams would be more of a threat than Jamarcus Lawrence, more of a scoring threat for sure. He's a better shooter. I mean, fit six foot seven, fits more in a two guard spot. Wouldn't maybe that's a factor. Maybe that could be a factor in this decision. Yeah, maybe. And again, there's other things beyond basketball that lead the guys leaving. Sure. Maybe he just wanted to go back close to his family. Mm -hmm. He's a New Jersey guy, and his his closest friend, CJ Wilcher, another New Jersey guy, is no longer on the team. Like, okay. you know, I mean, maybe that had something to do with Good. it. And you know, again, these guys have all these voices in their ear, and I'm sure that there was maybe some prodding saying, "Hey, guess what? You you can do all that and more. Hit the open market, see what you can get." Hmm. I mean. Find a better place than Nebraska. Coming off an NCAA tournament appearance, sells out its its arena regularly. Coach is, has stability now for the next few years. Nil, sure. nil, everything. It just it's surprising to me because it, I don't know if Nebraska has ever been more attractive. Can I say that? I don't know if it's ever been more attractive than it is right now. Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm not. I mean, you train your brain now to not be surprised by any portal movement by anybody because there's a lot around the country you just can't explain. Mm -hmm. But I thought there'd be a little more stability. Yeah, and so this is the one for me. Like Eli Rice was a surprise. I think they, they certainly wanted to keep him just because they thought he had a high ceiling down the road. But again, he's a freshman from out of state. He's, he's moving on. Like you can at least understand that one. With Jamarcus, this is probably the biggest surprise to me. Like, yeah just because of you know the role that he had this year and then the opportunity he had going into next season like you 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 factored him into the equation oh, yeah. when you talked about next year's roster and when going into the off season there was a core group that they had to retain and there's three they absolutely needed to retain and as it looks it, they will barring, gary, barring any any sort of uh, unexpected changes yeah gary mass and uh williams. bryce williams and then jamarcus for me was the fourth guy on that so me too. i mean the, the, of all the departures and there's six of them now this is the biggest one and i think it's without saying that's it's probably by far the biggest one can you find though a better version of jamarcus yes. lawrence in the portal you can and they might be doing that like some of the visitors and guys that have, have been on campus i'm sure you, these kids get wind of it yeah so they've had two visitors with uh, frankie fiddler and william kyle but then um as of last night, Monday night, Fred Hoiberg hit the uh, skies on the, the Husker flight and checked out. Uh, he visited the kid from North Dakota State, um, Morgan. Um, I'm probably blanking on What's his name. His right name? Now. Morgan. 
I got it right here. So that Husker plane, they're using that for basketball. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Morgan, thank you. 6'10 center from North Dakota State. Uh, he was the first visit on Monday night. And then they went out to see, um, well, this is not confirmed yet, but the, the based off the, the destination, they went to Minneapolis. There's two bigs in the portal of Minneapolis in uh, Joshua, Ola Joseph, and whoa, whoa, whoa. yeah, and for the Alpine. Gopher? Really? Yeah. Both those guys are in? They're both, yeah. Minnesota's a lot like I mean. their whole, you just whole team. Yeah, so you just don't know. Those guys are both in. Yes. Oh boy. Yeah, and then uh, they went down to Illinois uh, to see a kid by the name of uh, I'm blanking on his name right there. Uh, Connor Hickman. Connor Hickman, a guard from Bradley, former teammate of Rink Mast, sharpshooter, three point guy, um, would fit that need of the the case a void. So you know they're they're already well on their way. There's also that JUCO player uh, Malik Ewan. Big six foot ten, number one JUCO player in the country that they were out down in Hutchinson, Kansas, visiting. Um, from from what I've heard, he is very high on Nebraska, and uh, Nebraska mm. is firmly in the mix in that recruitment if they want it. Mm. So, yes, they've lost a lot of guys, but outside of Jamarcus Lawrence and and maybe CJ Wilcher to an extent, like none of them are like it's standard key attrition. pieces. Yeah, so like as, as people are kind of blown away just by the sheer volume of departures right now, and I get it. Cause it's an adjustment, but this is the new world of college athletics. Attrition is going to happen where you're looking at four to five guys leaving every single office. Well, Robin, the guy from Wisconsin, they brought in the recruit, uh, Jankowski. Is that yeah, Nick Janowski? Janowski. Um, I mean, he, he's going to be a factor next year, right? They're yeah, a chance to. I mean, I mean he, could, he could play a role like what Eli Rice had this past season, okay, as a true freshman. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's unfortunate. I know a lot of people. This is the biggest turnoff about the portal era and the fact that you don't even get to know players. I mean, Not really. Eli Rice got here in June and now he's gone in April or March. Like it's kind of exciting. We, we hardly knew you. The the good thing is it's kind of exciting. It's off season excitement. Please name those Minnesota players again for the listeners. Uh, Pharrell Payne and Joseph Ola jo or Joshua Ola Joseph. They're serious inside players. Yeah, Payne's Payne's serious. a dog. Yeah, they're serious. And players. they have the NIL. To get these things done yeah i That's mean that team. was kind of one of the biggest hurdles facing nebraska with, with their basketball program is that they didn't have the nil chops weight chops whatever you want to call it to compete at, at, at the highest level and i think that the Development of this program over the last two years, the way that you know they they've produced a product that's not just enjoyable to watch on the court, but they're have they're built around guys that are likable and easy to root for. Uh, that is inherently bolstered the support and funding for basketball specific NIL. And I think that you're going to see that come into play here. When it comes down to beating out high level teams like elite teams for high level transfers. That'll show you where Nebraska's NIL is because ultimately that's what it's going to come down to. What a, what a, what a like the period. facilities and playing time, and all that sort of stuff. Like that's part of the it. Training table. That doesn't but, matter. Anymore. But if you can come in with a substantial NIL package, that's going to compete with the best of the best. You're going to get those guys. What a, what a period for Fred. Yep. Cause you gotta, you gotta build momentum. Critical. Off this, this NCAA tournament appearance. Yep. Oh, he's in it. And you got an AD in place that has kind of common connections with the state of Iowa where Fred yeah. Hoiberg's from and, I mean, yeah. I think Dan and, and Fred will be a good working relationship. I do. I don't know if that was always the case with Trev Alberts and Fred Hoiberg. I know. do. I'm going back to momentum. They had momentum after this season. You got to retain it. You can't have another 2014-15 where you're coming off this great tournament run, all this momentum behind you, and then you lose to Rhode Island the second game of the year. like, And then the thing completely tanks out from you. So, like, this is what you have to do. Keep the ball rolling. I think they will. All right. When we come back, um, we'll pick things back up with spring football discussion. You're listening here to the Husker Online Show. And we're back here on the Husker Online Show. Uh, Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, Robin Walsh. I'm going to talk some spring football. Um, but I want to make this announcement, guys. I will be in Chicago again Thursday, May 2nd. I you remember I went out there last August as well. Um, I'm going to be talking to the Chicagoans for Nebraska at the Big 10 offices there in Jeez. Rosemont and uh, it's a scholarship fundraising event that they put on last year. We had a great turnout, a great crowd um, that were, that were at the event. You present inside the big 10 offices though, like in their big meeting room. Um, so it's a cool experience and the ticket price includes all your drinks and all your food. I know. And obviously the money is a fundraiser towards scholarships that go towards 
um, area high school seniors that are going to go to the University of Nebraska. So it's a great cause, a great organization. Hmm. Uh, we did it last year. What I did learn going out there last year, we got a lot of listeners in Chicago. Yeah, that is – God dang. When When is this again? May 2nd. When What did they serve last year? What kind of dinner? Um, God, they had a lot of – hors d'oeuvres and good food. I mean, it was, hors it was, d'oeuvres. It was solid. Not memorable. It, the day I was in the office, no, it was good. I mean, the day I was in the office though, it was when Washington and yeah. Oregon came to the big 10. Oh, you could have done some work. And I was walking around with as you. it was going on. You're so, like walk around like Tony Petini. But yeah, that big 10 office is right next to the O'Hare airport. Yeah. I've seen it. So I'm taking the family with me. Oh, and we're going to do the Into American Chicago. Yeah, we're going to do the American girl thing the next day and then maybe a Cubs game. The American girl thing. Help me with that. The American girl store. Okay. In Chicago, which is oh, the largest fun. one. And I got two daughters that are in yeah. fourth and first grade that it's like a highlight of their life to go to the store. big deal. So. Yeah. That sounds good. So <laughs> May 2nd, all the information. Uh, I put it on Twitter as well, but uh, at the Big Ten offices in Chicago. Hope wow. to see. Um, any of our Chicago area viewers, listeners out there for that event. May it, was, it was awesome um, to get the chance to do that last year. Looking forward to be there again. But, okay, let's continue spring football discussion. Um, you know, one thing I want to hit on is recruiting because this is a very big part of what's going on right now. I would say the recruiting storylines that emerge in the next few weeks are as big as the football ones because this right. this month – will develop the recruiting class and they've had some big kids already on campus. Noah McKell was here. We interviewed him on recruit spotlight this last week. Um, he's the top linebacker on the entire West coast, the class top. of 2025. Correct. Yeah. I mean, there's some 26s and 27s, but we're really, th- we're talking 25s. Malachi Goodman um, will be back again this week. Top lineman from the state of New Jersey. So that's, Recruiting is different now because the window between March and June is when all the work gets done now. Isn't that something? Yeah. I mean, Noah McHale was at practice today. We're talking on Tuesday. So he was he was there taking it in. Um, God, Sean, what you said is really – I just hope people understand that. Like people that – oh, you know, older guys like me got used to recruiting a certain way. It's so much different now. This is the time. The part be that about it. I'm most uncomfortable with is the the home game weekends aren't as big of a factor for Nebraska. I mean, they right. can be for underclassmen, right? But usually, <clears throat> a guy when they can take official visits, the home game weekends already out of the picture. I mean that that is the best thing Nebraska can sell as a game day Saturday. So they've got to sell these recruits, and you hope to get them in Lincoln two or three times between March and June. You, yeah, the, I going back to the home game, Sean. You say that, but man, we go to those home games. There's there's a ton of recruits. There. Oh, for sure, younger guys, but probably. not as many of the big official weekends. Okay, like these these are day trips. <clears throat> oh, okay, where they come in. Um, but yeah, you you need to get those kids that are young. Then you get them back in March and April, and then hopefully get them back in June. And the Nebra- cool. Nebraska will have probably three big official visit weekends for football one on the spring game weekend. And then you're looking at probably two in June. Okay. And, and those will be where a lot of the work gets done with the official visitors. Okay. Yeah. So Tony white talked about that today. What, what recruits see when they come watch his defense. And I thought he had a great answer. He said, what they see, this is a great answer by the way. And it, it should make, people feel confident about a Nebraska defense that was ranked 11th at the end of last year nationally in total defense. He said, you'll see a bunch of kids who believe that clearly believe in what they're doing, um, that are all in understand it. And it's easy to believe in because you watch their defense and there wasn't a lot of bus. Um, they were sound. And like Robin was saying earlier, now that was, that was, that was after a period of, probably a little bit of scramble when they first started because of the first year staff Set, they settled in really well. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is probably a top 15 defense. Well, Nash Hutmacher, we talked to him this week and 295 is what he weighed on Tuesday. Six four two ninety five, And you can see it in his neck. He you just, can. He looks thin mm-hmm. in the neck. He does. Mm-hmm. Face is smaller, neck smaller. He says during wrestling season, that was some of the best condition he's been in his life. Mm-hmm. 
I think it clearly helped him. I mean, well, Tanner Farmer is a great example of a guy that helped. Tanner Farmer, from what years was that? Well, he was a Pelini guy. Okay. And he finished with Mike Riley. Okay. But he um, kind of lost his edge and he went back to wrestling and competed a limited amount in pra practice. And then he was able to um, wrestle and join the football team. But yeah, look at Nash. I mean, yeah, look at this different look. And he'll get up to about 310. I'm not worried about that. No. Yeah, I'm not worried about Nash Hutmacher losing a lot of strength. He's the polar bear. No, he. I mean, he came in. I know previous strength coach Zach Duvall, I, I believe that staff said this, that as far as an incoming freshman, he was this, one of the strongest guys they ever worked with for a guy that's coming in out of high school. Boy, Nash, Nash is so critical to the defense. you got to be strong up the middle. That's where he's at. Ty Robinson, Nash Hutmacher, Cam Lenhart, those type of – I mean, Jamari Butler. Oh, my God, those guys are – I mean, they're good. They're good. And if they get better, that's what I'm talking about. Can one, like can Nash be an All Big Ten player? I think he's Van I think, Poppel. Yeah, I, Von Poppel's big in that equation. But when I talk about All Big Ten players, Nash is the type of guy that could be that. He was close last yeah. year. Yeah, he's the not, entire the first ones that come to mind. Yeah, yeah, I agree. One he's, of the things that stood out to me about Tony White's little interview was when he was asked about the cornerback position, and you know, I. I other than Tommy Hill, who else is in that? Yeah. And he named the usual suspects, Malcolm Hartzog, Ethan Nation, Mari Buford, Jeremiah Charles. He said Except there's a whole bunch more. of guys working there. But one of the things that he followed with, something really caught my attention, it goes back to recruiting, especially with the notion of recruiting to a position mm -hmm. on defense. He says, it's not so much about what position they play, but what can they do? So when it comes to where a guy is going to play, it's about finding the best position that tailors his skill set. So he might be recruited as a cornerback or a safety, but that doesn't have anything to do with what he's going to do in Nebraska's defense and where he's best suited in that system. So like not only just as it pertains to the depth chart this year, but I think looking ahead, when you see him take all these defensive backs, not mm -hmm. only are they talking about maybe like a, a, a jab and right moving up to linebacker or anything like that, but you could play corner safety, nickel, yep. like any, any of Ooh. those spots, the interchangeability if that's even a word it of is. this defense, it is a word is, is it continues to hammer home to me that like, uh, you don't pigeonhole a guy like Malcolm Hartzog is not just a corner. Like he could play safety, you know, same thing with Marcus, B Marquise Buford. Like mm -hmm. there's so many guys like that, that you can move to two or three different spots within that secondary. And I think that's going to be kind of the vision with these prospects that are visiting and, and recruits that come in just because they're listed on their profile as one position has no bearing on what their position is going to be at the Nebraska. It's ridiculous how many young defensive backs are on that scholarship chart when you look at the freshman or retro freshman. Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't even mention – he didn't mention Boodle, who you know can play. Mm -hmm. He didn't mention Jeremiah Charles, who he kind did. of become – Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, my bad. Um, He's the Jer last, last Jeremiah guy. Charles was featured heavily in the uh, Chasing Three along with Jalen Lloyd. Okay. And, and that was fascinating to see his development and – you got to give Coach real credit on a guy like that. He'd have no offers. He was going. He wasn't even going to do football in college. Well, I'm not going. Okay. And and Rule watched him play basketball, and they offered him, and and they've seen him blossom and develop behind the scenes. Now, will it transfer to on the field? That's the thing. That's where the bowling shirt expert Steve Sipple over here is going to weigh in. Yeah, I was about to say, and I wasn't being an ass. I, I was just going to say, I'm not going to give Coach Rule a lot of credit until, until we just, know. Yeah, no, and I agree. tackle. You know, I mean. Um, he hasn't made one yet, so we'll see. Yeah, like. Well, and we've fallen on these spring <laughs> landmines before. Oh, I have, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them. Where you spend like the whole weekend writing a story on a guy that never ends up playing, right? <laughs> Sip and I were talking about this earlier today, where uh, you know because of the AD stuff and the basketball stuff, like they've kind of that 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 first week of spring football kind of got delayed as far as like our access is concerned, and so mm -hmm. like in a way that eliminates like that week three of spring practice where like you're writing about like the backup walk like, on fullback or something like that, where you're just like scraping the bottom of the barrel full stories. Like we haven't even like scratched the surface no. on the storylines of this the, team uh, and we're already four practices in. So that's, that's a good thing for our sake. It the washhead has worked hard behind the scenes yeah. to earn respect <laughs> of teammates. That, that story, Ooh, yeah. you guys are getting pretty cynical now. <laughs> Well, you need to check. When you yourself. read enough of those stories, they all kind of blend together. You got to find a sense of wonder in those things. The competition within camp made this team better. <laughs> all right, Sean, you're horrible. <laughs> you wrote that story, probably. That's why. Of you're... course, I have. <laughs> I'd say have. probably a minimum of twenty-eight times. <laughs> iron sharpens iron. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah.
<laughs> You've already heard All right. that a few times. <laughs> I was hoping, you, it, it, and you're not going to fall on the landmine to overwrite about the three teams, the rattlesnake, boys, I, and the, the bug eaters, the rattlesnake boys, and the old gold knights. I don't think I'm going to do the whole, this is the way they're practicing thing. I might have, you might have. Because to. it's just a portion of practice. Like, yeah. it's a way to, like, make it fun to get all three fields going. Like, they, they said it themselves today. Like, they, they're still doing like their first team, like their their top groups working together. Right. Like this isn't just you're exclusively on the rattlesnake boys. And right. You don't practice at all with their members of the guys. of the spring league. So like the I mean, Donies a rattlesnake boy, right? Yeah. So I, I think it's another innovative way to just create competition. competition. And like when you hit that grind of the back week of, of spring, like that competition, I think is going to be a good motivator to, to keep keep the the juices going i envision fedoni with a rattlesnake yeah bringing a rattlesnake like, to the field yeah <laughs> come to the podium with a rattler <laughs> his neck. i mean Jake the snake i, 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 I could see him doing something like that <laughs> it's our official mascot it's not advisable <laughs> start tight all right my rattlesnake when we come back we'll bring abby barmore in and she'll add some sanity to the show Please. and we'll take your questions in the mailbag you're listening here to the husker online show and we're back here on the husker online show sean callahan steve sipple robin washa abby barmore as we are about to delve in the mailbag abby who is the mailbag brought to you by larson motors of course and who is the legendary spokesperson <laughs> for larson motors steve sipple himself no oh, wow <laughs> yeah, we should thank Larson Motors in Nebraska City. If you're looking for a new vehicle, go for a new experience at Larson Motors in Nebraska City. Larson Motors is one of the Midwest's only dealerships with all the major brands in one lot or one location, we should say. It's finding your new Chevrolet, GMC, Hummer, Ford, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, or Ram never has been easier. Start your new experience today at LarsonMotorGroup.com or at Larson Motors in Nebraska City. Larson Motors, real people, and what do we always say, Sean? Real deals. Yeah, real deals. It's kind of they're like an all-you-can-eat buffet that has like steak, Italian, and they got everything there. It's a great, good analogy, good food analogy, and you would drive forty-five miles for a good buffet, right? If you're from Lincoln, or you, <laughs> where, how long is it from Omaha? Probably about the same. About this, a little bit closer. They're they're yeah. they're thirty to forty five minutes each way. They're in a good spot. Maybe yeah. hit it on the way to Kansas City. You know, we drove by it on our trip down to KC. Yeah, that's right. right. But all right, let's get into the mailbag, Abby. Okay, our first question. So we've been talking about the Nebraska Spring League, right? Well, we're gonna have a mini draft. So uh -oh. you're a GM of one of these teams. Wow. You get to pick one guy who are you going to build your team around and let's not pick quarterbacks because that seems too obvious so what's the draft order here okay. sean can go first sean goes first, first pick. then yeah. we can go robin With the first pick in the 2024 husker online <laughs> nebraska spring draft sean callahan selects nash hutmacher oh mm. god mm. <sighs> okay um with the second pick in the 2024 Husker Online Nebraska Spring League draft. Robin Washett selects. You don't even know, do you? Ty Robinson. Ty Robinson. Ooh, okay. You took mine. Sean took one of mine. You took the second one of mine. I'm building in the trenches. Okay. This is a tough one. With the third pick in the 2024 Husker draft, I'm taking... Lockdown corner and return man Tommy. Whoa! Yeah. Oh, taking Tommy. Hill. So if it was a snake pick, you'd go next. Who'd be your next pick? Would you oh, take? Okay. Would you go O line or receiver? I go O line. Ben I'd Hart. Probably, yeah, with the or second, Ben Scott. Would, would you let me pick? Um, <laughs> I'm getting too excited for your draft <laughs> prospects here. <laughs> it was. I was pretty locked in on one of those guys. I'd like to say a left tackle, but I just don't think I could take Teddy there. Um, I go Ben Scott, experienced, mm -hmm. and, and he, I thought he was. I thought he was good last year. Okay, Ben Scott. Yep. Are you taking Robin for years? Next one, Snake Back. You know what? I still haven't even seen him play, but just based off everything I heard, I, I need a program guy, and I'm getting Jamal Banks. Oh, that's a good one. He's proven. Mm -hmm. Ah, God, my fan base is going. What <laughs> were you doing? <laughs> I mean, I think at number six, where I'm at, I, I'm I'm going to go like a Pittsburgh Steelers style pick here, and just take Bryce Benhart. Okay. So I, good, I got I like Ben Hart. I got Nash. 
Rob, you, Rob, I'm, my yeah. fan base is torqued. All right, I don't know. You did okay. That's our, and we'll we'll kind of do something That's like this. One, our Abby. top, our top forty Thank Huskers. You. Abby, that was one of the better mailbag questions we've had in a while. I came up with that one myself. Good job, Abby. What's your next question? Robin. Okay, next one. This is also kind of a longer one, so we could go bit by bit. Who are your way too early picks for? We have rushing yards, catches, touchdowns, tackles, interceptions, sacks. Oh, boy. So first one, rushing yards. Emmett Johnson today. Okay. Are you going to go Gabe Irvin? I'm or? going Gabe Irvin. Yeah, I think he's got the best opportunity to do it, assuming he stays healthy. I'll say Irvin. Okay, next one, catches. Jamal Banks. Yeah. I think we all agree on Jamal Banks, the Wake Forest transfer. Touchdowns? Mm. Ooh. I'm going to go for Doney on touchdowns. He had four last year. I think that number goes to eight or nine. I think Banks could have more Banks than that, could though. Banks is, is a, could do that. Naor, remember Isaiah Naor mm -hmm. had 12 touchdown catches at Wyoming in 2021, I believe it was 2021. Yes. Naor had 12 in a season. That's a number that really gets my attention. What about Rayola? Well, are we, are we crediting passing that? touchdowns? I mean, yeah. You could count it. I was going by just like individual scores. Yeah. It's so that's kind of hard to factor yeah, in. Should have, if he's the starting quarterback, you should have 20 plus touchdowns. Yeah. Like you would like to see his number of touchdown passes around 25. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, yeah, if you're being conservative, I'll go right. Banks too. I think, I think Banks. I'm going to go him yards, receiving yards, and touchdowns. Oh, like, Ban okay. Banks could be a thousand and, and a 10 touchdown guy. Yeah. Banks was a, Banks was, I mean, he was a 62 catch guy at Wake Forest last year. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the yardage number was, but 62. He had 59 catches in 2022 and 62 in 2023. He's proven it's a good draft. Pick. What you hope when you see Banks the first game or a spring game, even like you can just know right away. Yep. They got one. You don't want like this to go deep or you don't know what you have there. You hope like right away we know he's a guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think I, I'm not too worried about it. He's done it in the ACC. That's a tough league. Mm -hmm. Okay, who do you got for most tackles? The last few years it's kind of been easy, but this year more difficult. Mm. Tackles. Most tackles. I mean, Bullock's got to be in there. Yep. Gifford's got to be in there. Mm -hmm. Bayer. Well, Gifford, I think, led him last mm -hmm. year. So Gifford's I think, the I think the position he plays, kind of that up in the box safety, like that just leads to a lot of volume for tackles. And they're they're going to rotate those linebackers. Yeah, I'll go Gifford. Isaac Gifford, who that's our pick. If I'm not wrong, he was the leading tackler last year by a long way. He didn't have a hundred tackles, though. I don't think. No, he I mean, didn't. And I think that they rotate a lot, so it's hard to get a hundred. I'm right about that. Are you looking at the stats? Do okay. you have eighty five? Well, Reimer was nicked up. I got to pull it up first. Anyway, we got next. Next one, interceptions. Most mm. interceptions. Tommy Hill. How many? Six. Ooh, big number. It's mm. a big number. What about Buford? Yeah, that's a good pick. And then that's last one, pick. most sacks. Yeah. Spread around, probably. Mm. I mean, I'll say Lenhart. Can anybody get 10? Think about hot now. Uh, I don't know about 10. I mean, Khalil Davis is the last husker to get 10. Oh, it was. Prince will be in that conversation too. Did Khalil Davis get ten? Yes, I thought yeah. Randy might have been the last one. Yeah, Khalil Davis is the last. Randy was the Randy Gregg before that. Okay, but, Khalil Davis. Yeah, had Khalil 10. Davis. His last year had ten or like ten and a half or you know a year like that. That's a good, that's a good year. They have a guy that can get ten. I don't know about that, guys. I don't. I. I, I just. I don't know. I. I Lenhart comes seen, to mind. I think they have Ty the Robinson get like six. I think if Cam Lenhart doesn't get hurt early in the season, he's probably around eight, right? Mm -hmm. With the way that he was starting the year last year as a true freshman, he should get eight if he stays healthy. Yeah, I think he can. He can get there. James Williams could sneak some. I think you need especially a, if he plays more. You need a game though where you get like three. Yep, and then that that's how you get the. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not going to do it. I mean, you, you need one game where you just go off. What? What? We're not mentioning Butler at all. He's a guy. Yeah, he led him in sacks last year. Right. Five and a half. Yeah. Jamari Butler's a guy that can go from five and a half to eight and a half to nine, I would think. No Ten's a big number. It is. It, you should have somebody, though. To your question, Sipple, Isaac Gifford led Nebraska with 86 tackles. Omar Brown and Javin Wright were second with 51. Yeah, long so ways. Okay. 35 more tackles. All right. What do you need more on that one? Nope. That's that's all of them. Okay. <laughs> is that enough? <laughs> we have time for one more, Abby. Okay. Our final one. Both of the final fours are set. Who is your picks to win it all? Come on. 
I'll help you make this. One. I think yeah. South Carolina will beat Iowa um, in the oh, women's. You know, the women's yeah, okay. first. Yeah. She just she said both. Yeah, she did. Oh, there are did. two. Um, I just got admonished. Yeah, but <laughs> both of us. I don't think South Iowa is going to slip by South Carolina this year. Yeah, I think looking at the odds, like South Carolina is the overwhelming oh, favorite. God, yes. Yeah. They smother you on defense with mm-hmm. their defense. And they have size. That yeah. UConn Iowa game is going to be good. Um, I, I will say, though, on the men's side, I have a hard time seeing Purdue beating UConn. I, I just think in the you, final. In the final. I think those those two teams are almost double digit favorites in the semis. Yep. I think UConn, you know, if they can win this championship, we're, we're going to talk about this team as a, one of the better teams of this era. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and UConn, it would be UConn's sixth title. They ended the kind of discussion, is UConn a blue blood last year? But yeah, it's you're starting to see this team mentioned with 96 the Kentucky or 92 Duke mm-hmm. um, or more recent vintage. There's uh, 212 North Carolina, 215 Kentucky. 215 Kentucky, I, was that Devin Booker and in Carl Anthony Towns, I think so. Think about that for a second. By the way, Devin Booker and Carl Anthony Towns on a team. Well, um, Hur- Hurley's put himself up there as the top coach in the game. Yeah, now, he's too. put himself up there as the top, maybe the top coach and probably the most obnoxious coach too. <laughs> God bless him. Oh, he'd, he'd be a treat to work around. Oh Jesus! Um, you, but he's you'd get good. phone calls from him. I bet. Yeah, he's got a team, and he plays that kind of Bo Pelini card. Us, mm-hmm. he, he he just says us against the nation. We're a very obnoxious fan base. Um, and he plays that card us against the world and it's working it's working and i and i and i'm he's obnoxious but he's a great coach there's no doubt about it i still think that the one team that can beat yukon is purdue just because they have the cheat code <laughs> yes the biggest cheat code in the history of college basketball in zach Eady, and they've got the point guard play with Braden smith and what got, that's the that's how do you the win part. these types of games elite bigs and High level point but guard. Kling and can't Kling and yeah. take care of Edie. Uh, I don't know. Depends on how the game's officiated. Yeah. If Zach Edie gets the line 15, 20 16, times. 20 times, that that's the game. It's a cheat code. Like UConn has never played anybody like Zach Edie. So that's that's the difference there. That's that's the one reason why I give Purdue a chance. First of all, they have to get past NC State, which by the way, if you're a Nebraska fan looking for any semblance of optimism, look at what North Carolina State's doing. They came a buzzer beater in the quarterfinal ACC tournament game. From this, not even, not even making the tournament. They were down five with a minute left, and now they're in. Now they're in the final four. Yeah, and then automatically he wins himself a con, uh, extension by winning the conference tournament. So, like, if they can do it, there's absolutely no reason why Nebraska can't someday not just win a tournament game, but make a run. One hundred. Hey Rob, how much do you think people study that Nebraska film against Purdue? I don't know why you wouldn't. And people that know Hoiberg probably reach out to him just because mm-hmm. Hoiberg has had the best plan on Edie for Zach two Edie's straight years. Like three worst games over the last two years have come against Nebraska. So you give that assistant credit, Nate Lenzer. Nate Lenzer. Yes. Yes. Iowa guy. Yeah, yeah. but again, it's just kind of luck too because with Nebraska, they just have to double triple ed every time he gets the ball and then they hope that purdue misses threes well when they beat him purdue misses threes when they don't like every time they play in mackie they get torched like that friday so, night game in mackie when it was over before like yeah, under 16 I mean, time out i think it's 21 to 3 it's one of those deals where like to three. you just we're gonna let anybody but the seven foot four 300 pound dude beat us seems like a pretty. Hey, i'm glad you mentioned player. Braden smith i mean i think he's i he's mean he's what just, makes this purdue team different yeah me. He's a he's legit all Big Ten guard. I mean, he's one of the best point guards in the nation. Yeah. Um, so I, he's critical. And do the the question I have is, do they have the surrounding cast other than Braden Smith and Edie to beat UConn? And, I don't know. Yeah, F- Fletcher Lawyer's got a hit. I mean, he's got he's got a lot of inconsistency him. around those yeah, two. There are. All right. When we come back, um, I want to talk a little bit more football discussion. There's talk about adding a new um, unlimited rule of assistant coaches in college football. We want to discuss that and the impact it might have to Nebraska and other places next. You're listening here to the Husker Online Show. Final segment here of the Husker Online Show, Sean Callahan, Steve Sipple, Robin Washett. Uh, before we get into some discussion, um, if you're not a member of HuskerOnline.com, make sure you check us out right now. Get all the access to spring practice content. 
Abby Barmore's volleyball content, Robin Washett's basketball content, our recruiting coverage with Brian Munson, all the great content. We got a great special right now. Get two months for one dollar by simply using promo code NU1. That is the best deal you're going to find. Um, that's promo code NU1, two months for one dollar to start out at Husker Online. Uh, take advantage of this great special. All right, guys. I want to talk as we close the show, a new rule that could go into effect for next year. Mm -hmm. And I know they've been trying to pass this for at least another a full year or two and it hasn't yeah. passed, but right. there's a lot of momentum that it is going to pass here this spring to allow unlimited on the field paid coaches. Meaning right now you're allowed 10 assistant coaches and a head coach graduate assistants can be on the field. Um, but you're really limited with like quality controls and analyst people, what they can do. If this rule passes, you will be able to have unlimited people as assistant coaches where you'd have a receivers coach and then an assistant receivers coach. You could do it that way. All the way down the line. Um, so you could take your staff and go from 10 on the field full-time coaches to possibly maybe 20 or more. There's no limit. Mm -mm. That means coaches that get fired, they're not going to have a hard time finding work. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for coaches trying to find gigs because uh, you can just slide into kind of a number two position somewhere um, just to stay in the game and and and, and whatnot. So I, I think it's a good thing because people are already doing it anyway. It's just a matter of how your compliance department com will police it at the school you're at. Right. So people will be a little confused, Sean, by when you say a lot of guys will get jobs out of this. They will. But the confusing thing to people would be, well, okay, wait a second. So they're just going to hire staff members that are already on on the – on the staff, analysts, directors of player personnel, those type of like guys. Mike Dawson right now is a senior analyst at Kansas, right? And so logically, Lance Leipold, that this rule passes, he'll, he can he can use Mike Dawson on the field now. He might, yeah, he might, he just might do that. So, and we're we're talking about the ability of these guys to pr to provide tactical coaching instruction, skill coaching instruction, which right now rules prohibit it from happening as Sean mentioned, it is happening against the rules. The NCAA can't enforce it. That's one of the reasons that Craig Bowl, who's the American Football Coaches Association executive director, it's one of the reasons why he's very in favor of it. It's, it's impossible, next to impossible, it, to police. It's been enforced only when ADs want to be a pain in the rear to the head coach. An get, example. Like Rich Rodriguez had it happen to him at Michigan. Jim Harbaugh. When he was on some water, had it happen in Michigan, and Trev Alberts famously, um, you know, tried to really make it a big deal with Scott Frost that Jonathan Rutledge did too much, did more than he was allowed as a special teams analyst. Yeah, as far and Robin would remember that very kind of ridiculous day. It was, it was when you look back, and I thought at the time it was ridiculous. I wrote it that Trev actually stood next to Scott Frost after a practice in a full suit, in a full suit. In, in sort of this principal like posture and admonished the coach and said, we have this situation under control. I mean, what a grand piece of crap that all was. I mean, it was really embarrassing. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. Th this will probably happen. The other thing that Bull said was, okay, Sean, you raised this in a phone call with me, is that people talk about an uneven playing field. The, the, the playing field is extraordinarily uneven already. This isn't going to affect mm -hmm. it. What what NIL has done is created a massively uneven playing field with a place like Nebraska with, or a lot of places with, I'll say $8 million available to NI, for NIL versus schools, even in a school like UCLA that doesn't even have a million dollars of NIL. Uneven playing field. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's too power conference teams that's not even talking about utep versus nebraska in that scenario so, so yeah some schools guys will hire 40 coaches some will hire 20 maybe 15 um who knows and the, and the pay scale will vary it has to be some of these guys might only make 10 20 thousand dollars and some could make three hundred thousand dollars in these God dang would it be that low 20 000? well like a lo low level third the lowest they can get away with yeah you know, an area I think that this rule would really help just the overall game of college football is roster retention. 
because how many times yes. do you see guys that they come, especially from out of state, they move to a school and then they just kind of go through the motions and they barely have any interactions with their Coach. primary full-time coaches just because their coaches are dealing with so many guys. Like you can't spend an, enough quality time with each individual player and get to know them on that personal level the way you could if you Great had point. a bigger staff, yeah. even if it's just an analyst that's there, like yeah. that's working with four or five guys, yeah. you know, and, and is really dialed in with those four or five guys. And they feel like they have uh, an advocate on the staff, like someone that really connects with them and cares about them, mm -hmm. like more to a, like a, a, a next level personally than what even their position coach would be. That I think just comfort of having that person there and that relationship there would go a long way in convincing someone to stay as opposed to, well, I don't belong here. I don't fit in here. I'm going to go back closer to home. Yep. It's really gone full circle yep. because back in the, the early days of college football, the 60s, 70s, 80s, you had essentially unlimited coaches. Oh, you did? I didn't know that. Well, you had a Sorry. freshman team. True. You had freshman coaches. Yeah. I mean, like Scott Downing was one of the head freshman coaches. Frank Solich got his start from Lincoln Southeast. He came here as It'd be like taking Paul Lamaggi, just winning his state championships at Westside, and then they made Paul Lamaggi the head freshman coach. That's yep. what Frank Solich did. He came Frank from Lincoln did, Southeast yep. Yep. and became the head freshman coach. Then he advanced up. I believe it was Mike Corgan was the running backs coach. Mm -hmm. Then he replaced Mike Corgan as the running That's backs right. coach. That's right. Now that you mention it, you're exactly right. Yeah, the freshman, the freshman team at Nebraska had a long line of pretty good coaches. Dan Young, another yeah. successful Omaha Westside high school coach came into that team. Yeah. So you can, I mean, that would actually open the door for maybe some of these high school football coaches. Like if Matt rule wants to hire a guy, that's a great high school coach and you can't give him one of those main 10 jobs. Hey, let's bring him in as an assistant tight ends coach. Yeah. It can definitely happen. And then with recruiting, under the rule as proposed, there would still only be 11 people, 11 people live, 10 plus the head coach, 11 could go on the road. Yeah. And you can designate any of those bodies. Right. So you might, okay, let, let's, let's say like Mark Whipple is still here mm -hmm. or Bruce Reed. Take him off the road. You, you don't put those guys. I mean, I'm using older guys that don't really make sense to put out there on the road mm -hmm. and you know, you reserve those spots for the real salesman. Yeah. So it all makes sense. This it really does make sense. And here's the thing: as you, I, you, I just want to drive this home, Sean. You mentioned it. This could happen this summer and be in effect for the season. I mean, you're talking May or June when the Division One Council would have to approve it. Now they didn't approve it last spring, but I, but there, as you said, Sean, there's a lot of momentum. So I mean, this is right on us. I mean, it's right on us. It's it's probably going to happen. When's the vote? The season. It would be May or June. And it's going to make it, guys, where I think assistant coach hires won't be near as big of a no. splash. Uh-uh, they won't. Uh, because there's going to be so many of them. Right. Yeah, it's going to change sort of the news element of that. Like it used to be, I mean, assistant coach was like front page story. Right. But when there's going to be 30 or 40 of these guys, like it's not going to be near, you know, the Rich Rodriguez, not Rich, or um, Dana Holgerson type. Th those stories still will pop, mm -hmm. but it won't have near the juice. No. Still have to be documented, though. Yeah, correct. All right. Well, good show, guys. Yeah, really interesting. Lot to cover. Really um, lot to follow with Robin. Um, and put if, put him on notification. Yeah. Robin's gonna be busy. Good God, Rob. The hope is that after Jope, the attrition should be done. That's my read on it. Now the additions. Now, so the dead period runs from Thursday, April 4th to the 11th, that following Thursday. So you won't probably see any additions until after that. But I, that weekend, after the dead period, I think you're going to start to see some movement in the right direction for once. And they yeah. do that for the final four. All the coaches go out to the final Correct. four. The Correct. one that would left that would really freak me out if he left would, would be Sam <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had a falling out with the coach. Yes. He's no longer welcome at dinner. Uh, All right. <laughs> Sorry. Sam, just stay in the fold. What time's your bowling game? <laughs> bowling league. League. <laughs> Mark it eight, dude. I'm wearing the orange one. Now, going so. to Chops Bowl in South O. I'm wearing the orange one. The orange one? You better wear it. I'm wearing it on Thursday. Bright orange. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you again. Uh, great show for Abby Barmore, Steve Sipple. Robin watch it. Make sure you check out all our great work out on HuskerOnline.com. We'll be back later this week with headlines.